thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting uh, uh, me and my family here. This is really a, a wonderful trip and a, a dream come true. So uh, it's a real pleasure to speak to you all today about concurrency. Uh, I want to do two different talks today, one on threading and one on multiprocessing, and I'm going to do them concurrently. So I'll just say them at the same time and there will be no confusion. All right, fair enough. All right. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of uh, opportunity to be on stage to conduct surveys, so uh, uh, please participate in my quick survey. How many of you have tried Python 3? How many of you like Python 3? Yeah. Who wants the hard question now? How many of you uh, are using Python 3 in production or uh, plan to be using it in the next six months? Oh, thank goodness. This is uh, uh, the first time a year ago when I'd asked that question, we'd get only one or two hands. And we were a little worried because we're coming up on Python 3.6. How many of you are using Python 3.6 right now? Oh, so it'll only be me. I just built a fresh one uh, uh, this morning for you guys. So we'll, uh, we'll be using that uh, uh, today. Uh, how many of you follow me on Twitter? How many of you will follow me on Twitter if I zoom in on this part right here? <laughs> yeah. I'll know if I've got 200 new followers uh, uh, tomorrow. I teach Python through Twitter. Uh, I don't tweet when I, uh, I go travel to interesting places. I only uh, I tweet about how to use Python uh, effectively, what's going on in the Python community. So please take advantage of, uh, of that feed. Uh, how many of you uh, use uh, threading in Python? How many of you use concurrent, uh, uh, concurrent futures? How many of you use the multiprocessing module? How many of you use a uh, subprocess module? My work is done here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you a couple of uh, uh, very simple examples. And because they're so simple and because you're all experienced at them uh, with, with these topics, I think we'll have no problems at all uh, with these examples and we'll be able to go right through them. Uh, let's see. How many of you have ever used Sphinx as a uh, tool to generate your slides for a talk? It's fantastic. So what is our goal here? We'll walk through a couple of examples of threading and multiprocessing. Although we have to ask ourselves the question, why do you want concurrency uh, to begin with? One good reason is you want to improve uh, perceived user responsiveness to your system. Another is uh, how many of you want speed out of concurrency? That's good because uh, uh, concurrency can take away your speed as well as add to it. Sometimes you can get some advantage from additional cores. Sometimes concurrency can make your code go slower. That's an unpleasant uh, effect. Another reason to explore concurrency though is uh, a theme of the talk is it's how the real world works. We think of it as a computer programming concept, but in fact, the uh, concept is very large and goes uh, into project management and dealings with people. So my wife is a computer programmer and she programs uh, uh, the scheduling for the construction of satellites. And in the construction of satellites, there's over 100,000 discrete tasks. And in those tasks, those are people being coordinated. This team is designing the main bus. This team is uh, 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 designing the uh, uh, solar power cells. And pretty much all of the concurrency primitives that we use in a computer are also used in project management. These two teams have to finish before the, uh, each have to finish before the, uh, uh, the two parts can be assembled together. This is sim a simple thread join. Sometimes there's a room called the shaker room. In the shaker room, you put the satellite in it and you shake the snot out of it to see if it falls apart before you launch it. You can't have two satellites in the shaker room at the same time. You need mutual exclusion. You need locks. People communicate with each other through atomic message queues. I mean email. And it works uh, exactly the same way. So the physical, the analogs that we're talking here actually go very much deeper than Python. They go into the uh, real world and they cross, transcend programming languages. Fair enough. Uh, how many of you have heard of Alex Martelli? Okay, so he is a rock star in the uh, Python community and author of a uh, Python cookbook and Python in a nutshell. And he communicated to me this really interesting idea of scalability, which reflects his Google proclivities. He said, there are three kinds of uh, programs. There's single thread, single process programs that take advantage of one core. There's multi-threaded programs and multi-process programs that take advantage of the two to eight cores on your system. And then there's when you need more than eight cores, uh, for, you use, uh, switch techniques to distributed processing. 
here's his interesting observation. In our world, something is changing. The single core is getting more and more powerful. Uh, in the time that I've been computing, well over uh, 10,000 times more powerful than what I uh, had uh, started with. So the range of problems that can be solved here is much, much larger than it has uh, uh, been before. And so that makes this second category a little bit less relevant. But also encroaching into it is this one. It used to be uh, we had definitions of big data that were very small. Now our definitions of big data are very, very large. If you go to a big data conference, you'd better be saying the word PETA or it's not really big data. If it fits on your machine, it's not really big data. And Alex is suggesting that these problems are becoming more important and more prevalent and that we're going to have to resort to these techniques sooner. And a consequence of this is he suggests that for a lot of things a lot of people want to do, this middle section has becoming less and less relevant over time. Now, fighting this trend is us getting more and more cores on our, uh, our system, and it's real, uh, really unpleasant to only get one-eighth of the power of your, uh, your system. So we will talk about this uh, second section. How many of you have heard of the global interpreter lock? How many of you like the global interpreter lock? Really? <laughs> Larry Hastings seeks to get rid of it. I wish him good luck. Many uh, great men and women have tried before him and have determined that the global interpreter lock improves performance rather than hurts uh, performance. We will see. If he can make it disappear, we will uh, make him a saint and we'll make a, a, a church to him with onion domes on the uh, top of it. The likelihood is uh, not particularly high. So what's the effect of the gill? The effect of the gill is that no, the more than one thread can run at a time. That means that uh, threading is really great for I.O. bound applications in uh, Python. So uh, web servers and whatnot, multi-threading mostly works fine. However, if you have CPU bound applications, one of the most important things you can know is that if you add threading to a CPU bound uh, application, will it go faster or slower? Slower, okay? An amazing number of teams decide they want speed and decide to add threading. How well does that work out for them? Not well at all. So I'm going to uh, interlace my talk with lots of little tidbits of things that sound like small sound bites, but can actually save you enormous amounts of time. Now, a note on my ex-girlfriend. You, you guys want to talk about her, right? She was in human resources. And what do human resources do? People do. They don't program computers, they program people. And they have hacks too. And one of the things they do is the Jedi mind trick. And so here was uh, one of her Jedi mind tricks. She would say to me, Raymond, your weakness is your strength and your strength is your weakness. This would confuse me and I'd say, this is not actionable. What do I do? Get stronger, get weaker, I don't get it. What is the strength of threads? It's shared state. It means that threads can communicate very, very quickly. What's the weakness of threads? It's on the screen, I just said the answer, you know it, what's the weakness of threads? Shared state, which means that you're going to have race conditions. In fact, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but every multi-threaded program has a race condition because if it didn't, you didn't really need threading to begin with. You're not taking advantage of its uh, uh, strength. What about uh, the strength of processes? It's that they are independent of each other. They don't have shared state. That makes them a lot easier to work with. What's the weakness of uh, uh, processes? that they lack communication in shared state. Hence, it introduces the need for inter-process communication to move objects between them. You have to uh, a pickle and have other overhead. In the multi-processing module, we hide a lot of these details for you, from you. Do you think they're important anyway, even if they're hidden? Absolutely, they're important. When you're using multi-processing, you have to be aware if you move a lot of data, you're pickling it through IPC and there's a tremendous amount of uh, overhead. If you're using multi-processing in a thread pool, you have to be aware you've got, uh, good news is you've got shared state, the bad news is you've got uh, uh, potential for race conditions and the gill keeps you from using multiple cores. Fair enough? All right, let's start with some uh, really complex code. Two simple examples. Let's see if I can challenge your Python skills. How is this for some sophisticated Python code? Are you impressed? It takes a counter, it prints starting up, it loops 10 times, it increments the counter, prints the value of the counter, and prints finishing up. Are you impressed? 
Yes, I, I can teach people that much Python. By the way, I teach Python for a living. Uh, so the answer to the question that was asked of you uh, before is yes, education is the answer. People can be taught to code very well. In fact, I try and make my classes not at all about the syntax, but about the craft of using the language uh, uh, well. And so people can write this code in the first few hours of using uh, uh, Python. Do you agree that this code is easy? And it doesn't take long to write. The whole thing is only seven lines of uh, uh, code. I know what you're thinking. Raymond, how could we throw away everything that Nathan has, uh, Nathaniel has just taught us and make this hard? Why, yes, we can. We can do exactly this and expand it to 60 lines of code and dramatically imp improve, well, change it. Okay, now here's another really powerful piece of code that I can teach people to write on the first day. It has a, uh, a list of websites. We loop over the websites, open the website, read the web page, print out the URL and the length of the web page. And yes, I do know that you can look at the uh, content length header and not have to read the entire page, but that's not the point we're trying to demonstrate here. So this loops over and tells you the size of the home pages, some of which are very surprising, some are really compact, only 18K or 10K, and then there's other pages that are shockingly uh, 500K or uh, that are just enormous web pages and apparently they don't care about response time. I know what you're thinking. Can we throw away what Nathaniel taught us and make this code hard? After all, it's only four lines. Can we make it complex? The answer is yes. Would you like to proceed? All right, fair enough. Threading. I should actually start my timer because I have a lot of things to say about threading and only a little time to say it. So this is a scripting style that we just showed. What's great about it is it's simple and clear, but also it corresponds to the way I teach people to write code. I teach them to write with global variables, run it top to bottom, type a few lines, run it, type a few lines, run it, type a few lines, and run it. That incremental style of development is very quick. It lets you concretely see your results. It lets you test as you uh, go, and people can reliably knock out uh, uh, code even if they have very little programming background. Is this a pretty useful style? In fact, it is. Now, once you've got this, you can always move things into uh, uh, functions, but let's take a look at the output. The obvious output is it starts up, and it, says, it counts to 10, and says finishing up. So, one uh, important note for multi-threading, the most important principle, Get your app tested and debugged in a single threaded mode first, before you start threading. Threading or concurrency never makes problems easier. As soon as you add that to it, you've added a, a whole new layer of uh, uh, complexity. Plus, wasn't it nice to run our code and get it all tested? Doesn't testing make you feel good? We ran the code and it produced the desired output? Ah, you like testing. I see how it is. Suckers. Okay, here we go. The next step in the evolution is to move into uh, functions. I teach people after they've written that code to factor out the reusable components. In this case, we've got a reusable component, a worker, uh, a unit of thought that says, well, this worker's job is to increment the counter and print the uh, current uh, uh, task. And so now to drive it, now to keep the slide simple, I didn't put this in a, uh, a main section, but when you have your re reusable components, and then you have your testing components at the bottom that, uh, that use those. Uh, this code produces the same answer. I know because I run it and I see exactly the same answer. I've made a little refactoring and I've tested as I go. Do you like my methodology? Okay, I'm not going to lead you into any bad places if you trust me. <laughs> All right, so uh, do test your app before getting into multi-threading uh, mode. So multi-threading is amazingly easy to add to code. All we have to do is import threading and instead of calling our uh, worker function directly, we launch it in a thread. And so now we have a main thread running and we start up the uh, a worker thread. So the total amount of changes to this code is one line for the import and one line to launch the thread. Easy peasy? Any questions? Okay, so uh, should we uh, test our code? Yeah, okay. So we'll test the code to prove it's correct. You are all using Python 3.6, correct? Okay, yeah. So I ran Python uh, uh, 3.6 and uh, I'll read the uh, thread testing multi one. In fact, let's just go, we'll go run it. Not quick time.
There you go. Test it. The code is beautiful, factored, and tested. Ready to check in? No. Why? What's wrong with it? It's broken. It's broken, but it passes the test. Can you spot the race conditions in the code? Okay. Tell me what race condition you see. The global counter. Did you know that everybody sees that? Even on the first day of Python, everyone sees, oh, we could have one thread look up the value of a counter, another thread look up the same value of the counter, both of them increment the same base value, both of them write out the same incremented value, and you have two workers run and the counter is only incremented uh, one time. Everybody sees that. Which is interesting because it almost never shows up in real code. Even though there is a race condition here, this happens so fast that you could possibly run trillions of tests and never have this uh, problem show up. In fact, you could ship this as production code and run it lots of times and no problem will ever show up in your lifetime. And so even though you spotted a problem, you spotted a problem that is probably not that important to you. I say fix it anyway, but it is in fact a, uh, a problem. But what most people don't see is that printing is a resource as well. And in fact, uh, there is a race condition there. But we tested the code and it worked just fine. Should you trust testing? Never trust testing when it comes to multi-threaded code. It's useful, but many interesting race conditions never manifest themselves in test environments. In fact, they manifest themselves under load, under abnormal uh, uh, conditions, and in ways that are really hard to reproduce, creating Heisenbugs. Who's heard of a, a Heisenberg before? Who's heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? The idea is if you're looking at the bug, the act of looking at it causes it to change its behavior to where it's no longer uh, a buggy. In particular, if you run uh, code like this through a debugger, you will never see the race condition because the debugger uh, interferes with all of the uh, races. So there's a technique that can be used to amplify the race condition, and it's called fuzzing. It's an easy thing to add. I put in a sleep for a random amount of time. This is not a perfect technique, but it is a decent technique. And so in between each step in the operation, I add a little bit of fuzz, getting the old value, the old counter, the increment, fuzz, a print. Interestingly, the print has two separate steps, the print of the string that you wanted and the print of the uh, a new line. So I'm separating those two. And so I just added a little fuzz. Otherwise, this is the same code. Here's the output of the fuzzed result. In fact, I'll just give you the, just do it live. Oh. Are you a little displeased now? This is exactly the same code, and this type of output could have happened in one of your production runs under load when interesting other things are going on in the processor in a non-reproducible environment. Are you convinced that fuzzing is good to help you use a leverage testing to find errors? I'm convinced that it is helpful. On the other hand, we've also learned to not rely on uh, uh, testing, and it suggests that this problem is harder than it looks. If you've uh, been convinced that the problem is harder than looks, I've already done a bar large part of my uh, uh, job. Uh, when I teach multi-threading and multi-processing, the first thing to teach is fear and respect. <laughs> it is a solvable problem, a winnable problem, but it is a problem that needs to be respected and needs to be feared. Are any of you pilots? I can fly an airplane. It's pretty easy. You get in the airplane, turn on the engine, aim it in the uh, uh, direction that you want to go. You look out the window for other airplanes, and if you see them, you don't aim for them. You try not to hit them. A simple thing. I know what you're thinking. What can we do to make this more complicated? Fly in a cloud. Now, once you're in a cloud and you can't see outside, the other airplanes have to tell you where they think they are. You have to tell them where you think you are. And it's, imagine when you're driving to work one day, you paint the windows of your car black. You get on a radio and say, I'm about to go through this intersection. Don't be there when I get there. And somebody says, ah, I don't think I'm in that intersection. Go ahead and go for it. Do you feel safe? So in fact, this is a dangerous thing. Every pilot who attempted it at the outset flew into a cloud and their life expectancy was about 30 seconds. 
and I'm not kidding, 30 seconds is the life expectancy of a pilot not trained for instrument flight conditions hitting a cloud. It's very hard to keep the airplane upright. Your uh, physical sensations will lie to you. You will be going down when you think you're going up. And so you fall out of the sky and die. Like multi-threading. In fact, though, you can be trained to fly in the clouds. The first person to do this was uh, uh, Jimmy Doolittle. And Doolittle uh, surprised a bunch of uh, generals by flying into an airfield when it was completely foggy. And he knew it was going to be completely foggy. And he was demonstrating the first instrument test flight. It turns out you can be trained to fly successfully in clouds. Can you be trained to successfully fly in uh, multi-threaded conditions? Yes, you can. I'm about to teach you. I don't have time to teach you in depth, but I will give you all of uh, the examples and the bullet points and go through them fairly quickly. But remember, there's two kinds of pilots, those who've been trained to go through methodically with a discipline and a careful approach to getting through the clouds, and those who have a life expectancy of 30 seconds. When you get your uh, 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 flight ratings, so you're going to call the Visual Flight Rules Pilot. VFR for the first rating and IFR for the second rating. And so VFR ratings can, uh, uh, pilots can only fly on clear days. Are you a VFR multi-threaded uh, programmer? So this was uh, taken from Mozilla. This is a, a fellow named uh, uh, David Barron. This is at his office in San, uh, San Francisco. He's at a stand-up desk there. And he's actually a quite uh, tall fellow. Not quite uh, uh, two meters tall, but uh, up there. About right here. See a big guy? Yes, he's very tall. And up above him is this little sign. <laughs> I think every office should have that sign. It says you can write multi-threaded code. You just need to be a little taller than you are now. So let's go stretch you, uh, uh, stretch you out. This will be more th careful threading. There's a couple of approaches. One is you can use locks, and another you could use atomic message queues. I'm going to show you the one that I favor first. Which one do I like? Atomic message queues. Don't use locks. Locks are great if you're writing an operating system. How many of you write operating systems? I didn't think so, because you wouldn't be using uh, uh, Python. <laughs> so locks are great for implementing OSs. But for anything higher level than that, real applications, people don't think in terms of locks. They're amazingly difficult to reason about. And so we want a higher level primitive. We'd like to have something that we can relate to. Atomic message queues. How many of you have an email account? How many of you have an atomic message queue? There's 100% uh, overlap. I would think of it in that regard. I'm saying atomic message queue because, in fact, we have a queue object in Python, but you can use RabbitMQ or active uh, a zero M MQ, active MQ, email accounts. You can use databases with locks. Almost anything that lets you communicate atomically uh, will work. Uh, how many of you have heard of RFCs before? Oh, OK. How many of you have heard of RRs? Oh, those are Raymond rules. OK, so Raymond rule 1000. All resources shall be run in exactly one thread. All communication with the uh, thread shall be done in an atomic message uh, queue. What type of resources need uh, this technique? Pretty much every resource that is shared. Global variable, input from a user, output, files, sockets. That said, there are some tools that already have locks built inside them. In particular, the logging module and uh, the decimal module has thread, uh, thread local variables, and databases tend to have reader and writer locks. Email is also an atomic message queue. Pretty much everything else should be uh, presumed to be non-atomic in nature and needs to be wrapped in its uh, uh, own thread. Next thing is uh, sequencing problems. How do you make sure that in multi-threaded environments, step A is uh, followed by, or step B is followed by A? It's a simple thing. If I have many people in this room acting concurrently, I can find Nathaniel and give him two tasks, do A and then do B. If I give it to him and it's in one thread, it's guaranteed to be performed sequentially. But if I give it to two different people, then I have to uh, form some type of message queue or locking in between them. What is the easiest way to make something sequential? Put it in one thread. Okay. 
What is a barrier? A barrier is a concept where you wait for parallel threads to uh, a complete. So in my wife's example, somebody making the main bus and someone making the power assembly, both of those have to finish before you can join the two together. With threading, we do that with a, a join. Join says, I take another thread and wait for it to uh, finish. Uh, once it's finished, I know its work is done and I can uh, proceed, presuming that work is done. Did all of you already know what join does? Fair enough. So it says wait for somebody to finish. When is a terrible time to wait for somebody to finish? When they're never going to finish. Let's say a thread has an infinite loop. What do we call a thread that has an infinite loop that never finishes? A daemon thread. So if you daemonize the thread, all it is is marking the thread to say that this thread is never going to finish. Don't wait on it. So you can't wait on them to complete, which raises the question, how do you uh, wait for them to finish their work? The answer is you use your email accounts. You send an email to a worker and say, I'd like you to do some work. Now, should you wait until uh, you can check and see whether they've read all their emails? If they've read all their emails, does that mean that they've done all of their work? I'll send Nathaniel an email. I'd like you to write a book on Python. Oh, hey, he raised his thumbs. He opened and read his email. Is he done writing his book? No. So it is insufficient to wait for the message queue to be empty. Instead, I need to send Nathaniel an email that says this. Write a book on Python. Then when you're done, write, uh, send me a note back saying that you're done. Easy enough? And so this is the traditional way to do it, which is two message queues. We built into Python. Uh, a technique that I invented and has become very popular, built into the message queue itself is a method called task done. So you retrieve a message, you do the work, and then you mark the task as being done so that someone can join not the thread, but join the email queue. So when you have non-daemon threads, you join the thread. When you have a daemon thread, what do you join? You join the email queue for talking to it. Fair enough. That's Raymond Rule 103. Global variables, are they good or bad? Ah, they are very, very bad. Are they uh, all over the place? Yes. Are they sometimes really convenient? Sometimes they are. Sometimes you want some, a few functions to share some state. Nathaniel would probably argue, uh, and I, I would agree with him, that the, uh, the shared state should probably be in a class. There's cases where we can't do that, though. The design of the decimal module requires that it has a global state for uh, the context of the decimal module. How many decimal places of precision are, are there? And this uh, specification for decimal says that this context has to be independent of all of the decimal objects. In other words, we can't put it in the class to implement the spec. Do you think that creates problems in a multi-threaded environment? Yeah. So uh, here's the worst of these. Uh, the worst of them is locale. Uh, how many of you have used locale before? So locale is a disaster because it was designed back in a time when we had big computers that didn't move and people who worked on the computers who all lived in the same country and never moved. Do we move around now? Yes, I just brought this uh, in from the United States and I'll be taking it back uh, uh, shortly. We do move around. And so our problem is locale is a global state, not just in your program, but across your entire computer. So you get a request from France. You change the French global uh, locale. You're starting to make some, do some processing on that request, but now you get a request from Germany, and you switch over to the German locale. The first uh, thread, or first process even, is affected by that state change. That's why locale is a disaster, and you can't use it in anything that is concurrent. Global state, good idea or bad idea? It's a really bad idea. I, I agree. So uh, to help us with that, we have uh, thread local variables, which says that you can have something that is, uh, appears global within your program, but is unique to each thread. It has its own global, so each one could set its own equivalent of locale or its own decimal context. Also, this is an interesting point. I get this all the time from experienced multi-threaded programmers. They look through Python's threading API and they say, hey, how do you kill a thread in Python? I said, why would you ask me such a crazy thing? And they said, well, you know you can kill a thread in Java. How many of you knew you could kill a thread in Java? You used to be able to kill a thread in Java, but they deprecated the method to do it. Why? Because it's a terrible idea. Don't do it. It's a conceptually flawed idea. It's not an implementation problem. It's a concept bug. Because 
if you try and kill a thread external to a thread, you never know if that thread is holding a lock while you're killing it. If you kill it while it's holding a lock, your program will deadlock. And we get bug reports on this all the time. Raymond, we tried to kill a thread in Python. Can you kill a thread in Python? Can, can you externally kill a thread in Python? Interestingly, there's a couple ways to do it. One is you can actually call the operating system and do a kill on the thread. Another way is to use the C types module uh, to reach into the thread and uh, uh, kill it. But we haven't provided a direct way because it's a terrible idea. When people get themselves in trouble using the other technique, what they're telling us is, Raymond, I've intentionally pulled out a gun that is labeled toe shooter offer, aimed it at my toe, and shot off my toe, and now I've got a problem. My toe is missing. Python is broken. We get bug reports like this all the time. Just because there's recipes published for it, would Nathaniel say that you should do it or not do it? He said, just because a language lets you do something doesn't mean you should do something. So here we are applying all of the rules. The counter has been isolated in its own thread. It has an infinite loop. Is it a daemon thread or a non-daemon thread? Yeah, it's a daemon thread. So we mark it as daemon here. So should you ever join this thread? Of course not. That's a terrible idea. It never returns. What are you going to join? You're going to join the uh, message queue. So we have an instance of counter queue. That's the email account for talking to uh, uh, this thread. And what this thread does is sleeps until somebody sends it an email saying increment. Once, uh, once it's got that, it uh, increments uh, uh, the counter. And then it sends an email to the printer saying print a message. Now, the printer might run at its own speed, but it also has an atomic message queue that sequences all of the actions coming in. Once it's done its task, it calls this method task done. Who invented the task done method? Oh, that was me. Okay, so uh, this marks as being done so that later you can wait on the queue itself to see if it's done. Separately, we've isolated the print resource. This has exclusive rights to uh, the print keyword. Once again, it has an infinite loop, daemon thread or non-daemon? It's a daemon thread. Does it eat clock cycles like crazy or does it sleep until it gets an email? It sleeps. This is a uh, uh, blocking. Is there a race condition here uh, in looping over the lines of the job and printing them? In fact, there is a race condition. Why is it not a problem? The secret to winning a race, if you're slow, is to be the only one in the race. So, because this has exclusive rights to the uh, print keyword and it's the only thread that uses print, it always wins the race. So, if you need to be something uh, to be sequential, put it in one thread. Easy enough? Okay. Workers, their job uh, just becomes to send a message to the counter queue. Remember, we can't increment directly. We can, uh, the rule is we only uh, communicate with it through the uh, uh, queue. The, the interesting parts are here. After we start the threads, we then join all the threads. Which one's uh, threads can we join, daemon or non-daemon? Non-daemon. The worker is a non-daemon. It doesn't have an infinite loop. It returns. So at this point, after this for loop is uh, finished, we are guaranteed that all of the workers are finished. Does that mean that all of the increments are done and all the counts are done? No, because all the worker's job was is to send an, uh, an email. So our guarantee at this point is that 10 emails have been sent to the counter queue. We don't know that it's counted yet or even awake yet. We just know 10 emails are sent. Now we need to know, is the counter itself uh, queue done? Do you wait on the counter queue to be empty? Of course not, because like Nathaniel in his book, are you finished with your book yet? No, he hasn't sent me an email telling me he's finished. So in this case, we're not waiting on the thread. We're waiting on the queue. We're at saying that for every email we sent in, was there a task done? Now we know that the, uh, right after this line, what has happened 10 times? We know that it's incremented 10 times. Has it printed 10 times? No, it sent 10 emails to the printer queue. So who do we need to wait on next? The printer. So we go ahead and send another message saying finished up. Are we guaranteed that it's printed all of the other messages by, by now? No, but we've guaranteed that it's gotten 11 emails, one the starting up, and then 10 consecutive print jobs. It's called a queue for a reason, because it's FIFO. So we're guaranteed that even though it's not finished yet, that this will be the last thing to print, which is uh, that it's done. 
Now, once we've sent 10 jobs to the printer, do we know that the printer is done printing? No, so we need to wait for the printer to mark that it's done, and that's the printer queue join. This is a correct solution to the problem. If you do anything less than this, your code is incorrect. And keep in mind, I started with a trivially simple problem. Do you have a little fear and respect for uh, multi-threading now? Do you have a methodology that will, a set of rules that will work for you? In fact, if you apply these rules, you can systematically work through this and guarantee logically that your code is uh, uh, correct. I've still got it fuzzed, so uh, I will go run it for you. Multi three, and you will see it uh, uh, slowly run, slow because of the fuzzing. But despite the fuzzing, it will still get the uh, uh, correct answer every time. Who learned something new? For production, should you leave your fuzzing in? There's some question about this. Uh, a book that I love, Programming Pearls, has a, a rule called leave the scaffolding in. And so one way to achieve the leaving the uh, uh, scaffolding in is to have your fuzzer have a true false value. Up here, I can set fuzz equal to false. It will skip the random sleep and run full speed ahead. And so that's one way to turn it off to get it to run full speed, but to leave it in for debugging uh, uh, purposes. Or you can just clean it up and take the code without fuzzing. So this is the code without fuzzing. Nothing terribly interesting here other than it's the correct solution to the uh, problem. Uh, the thing I find the most interesting is our seven lines of code is now about 60 lines. Does it take a little effort to get multi-threading uh, uh, correct? In fact, it does, and so that's part of the respect for it. Uh, if you were a manager, don't expect people to layer in multi-threading uh, as fast as they created the underlying application. It is far more complicated. And so having completed that test, I can now run it at full speed, multi four. And it runs just fine. Who learned? Something new. Is there any uh, technique other than using uh, message queues that you know about? Locks, are locks a good idea or a bad idea? They're a great idea if you're writing uh, an operating system. Here is the same solution, or what looks to be the same solution, with locks. I know it's not just a, a contrivance, because in class I give people an assignment sometimes to write this code with locks. And typically I give it to people who said, oh, this problem would be easier using locks. And uh, interestingly, it is a little easier to do using uh, 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 locks. Which surprised me, because they're a lower level uh, uh, primitive. Oh. And so this is typically the solution that people come up with. I need all of this to print atomically, so I do it with the printer lock. I need the uh, uh, counter to update atomically, and I still need the, uh, to know the counter value. Uh, all of this needs to be atomic, so that's done with the uh, uh, counter lock. And the with statement makes this clear and beautiful. How many of you like the with statement? It's kind of awesome. And so if I, uh, and this runs perfectly well, and uh, if I take the fuzzing out, you can see it's a little bit shorter than the other solution. Do you guys like the locking method? It's shorter, it's easier to do, and it was most obvious to most of the students in my class, it's the tool that they tended to reach for first. That won't happen to you, will it? That's a little bit of a tease. This code is perfect, it's beautiful, and it's simpler using the cues. Notes on locks. First thing is locks don't lock anything. Is the, is the print function locked in that code? We have a with printer lock. Somewhere else in the code, someone can add a print and not check for the lock. So locks don't really lock anything. And so you can't assume that because you wrote correct multi-threaded code that it will survive maintenance. Lots of multi-threaded code starts correct. But because your locks don't actually lock anything, someone is free to access your global variable anywhere. They are free to access print anywhere. Did locks lock anything? If you know that, you will stop trusting them as uh, uh, much as most people do. You've also been taught that they're a low-level primitive. But I didn't teach you what is, yet what is the real problem with this code. The good news is it's correct. The bad news is it's slower than the original. It takes no advantage of concurrency at all. And in fact, it is fully sequential. One of the interesting parts of locks is if you take any sufficiently complex act and put enough locks in it, eventually it becomes uh, sequential. We've actually undone all of the effects of multi-threading. This code logically does exactly the same as our first seven line version. 
Interestingly, I've had teams where I go out and do consulting. I see thousands of locks in their code and I start tracing through and working at the logic of it and I thought, wow, I really don't want to be the one to deliver the bad news for them. I said, I've got good news. Your code has no race conditions. It is in fact fully deterministic. It runs the same way every time regardless of the thread scheduler. What does that tell you? <laughs> okay, so this code is correct. It was also a complete waste of time. How many of you are liking locks now? To it, you can achieve the fluidity of uh, the uh, previous version. And how would you do it? You would essentially reinvent what I already did for you. I'm one of the uh, authors and maintainers of the Q module. The Q module has locks in it. I wrote uh, that module so that you don't have to reason with the low level tool and so that you don't have to uh, mess with all of the synchronization. Fair enough? Who learned? Something new. Lastly, there's the dining philosophy uh, there's problem. All of the techniques I gave you uh, above work great for direct acyclic graphs. However, when the control flow is circular, the problem is much harder. My re uh, it is uh, still solvable, but so much harder that you really do want to resort to uh, uh, formal techniques. Fair enough. And completely out of time? Or can I spill over five minutes? I'll do multi-processing very quickly. You've seen the scripting style. That's the code we looked at before. Function style. We just factored out a uh, function. What is the site size? This is, I believe, is an important step. The re remember, I suggested you should get your code correct in a single threaded, single process mode first. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to use map, which is sequential. So we test the code and make sure that it works. The great thing about switching to the map form is it makes it easy to transition to a multi-processing uh, uh, map. And so the multi-processing version of uh, map, the only thing we need to change is to the pool IMAP unordered. I'd like to show you a couple of little uh, tricks along the way here. One of them is that uh, the design of this function returns its input as well as its output which is kind of weird. The caller knows what the input is. Why do you need to return it? If you design your functions that way, it lets you use IMAP unordered and you don't have to care about the order of the results. This will greatly improve the responsiveness of uh, uh, your, your program. Who learned something new? Okay. A uh, couple thoughts on uh, multiprocessing is a lot of the thought process in multiprocess is trying to think about what's parallelizable and what's not. This looks like a simple bit of code. Open a URL, read it, and get its length. I'd like to analyze what parts are non-parallelizable. We have to do a DNS request to get the, uh, uh, over UDP to get the URL. We have to get a response to know what IP address it resolves to. We need to acquire a, a, a socket from the operating system. We need to uh, do the three-way handshake for a TCP connection, a SYN ACK and a SYN ACK. This is the part that takes the longest time. Well, actually this has a round trip on the net too. Uh, then we need to send an HTTP request. Then we need to wait for our responses. We get many packets and then join them all together. And then finally we count the uh, uh, pages, characters on the web page. These are all sequential actions. However, there is a little bit that's parallelizable. The, Doing the DNS lookup can be done in parallel with the getting of the socket. Is that worth it? Why is it not? Because this is expensive and uh, is measured in milliseconds. This is cheap and is measured in microseconds. And so there's really no value to parallelizing uh, these two uh, uh, themselves. This one is interesting. The HTTP request, when you're running from home, you've only got one connection out to the internet. But typically when you're running uh, from work, you've got a bundle of fiber. And there's really no reason that you can't send out, get many sockets and send out many HTTP range requests. Unless you're using HTTP2, in which case all kinds of good things happen for you automatically. So this is great because you can send out a hundred parallel requests, get the data to come back in parallel, and then reassemble it. This actually has a great deal of potential uh, to speed up your, uh, your code, and it's called channel bonding. I provided a link on an example of how to do that. And we don't have to wait until they're all done to count the characters. We can count them one packet at a time. In other words, uh, uh, this, these steps are parallelizable. It's also probably not worth your time unless there is an enormous amount of uh, uh, data here. If there's a lot of data, these steps are uh, worth it. So what's the better way? 
is to treat all of this as one step and to do uh, many different URLs in parallel. What I see when I go out and do consulting is people skipping this part, skipping the parallelization here, and instead they focused on this. Why? It's because they wrote this first and they knew it wanted it to be fast and so they will write a thousand lines of code to do this when in fact they could have come down here and written one line later. When you do multi-processing, do it at the highest level possible and then you get the greatest payoff. Uh, quick note on thin channel communication. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, a quick uh, a keynote that I'm, uh, talk that I'm giving right now. So I flew over here. It took, uh, I think, 18 hours of travel time to uh, fly here. And so I'm about to fly back home. And then tonight I've got a, uh, a tutorial that I'm giving and then I'll fly right back. What's wrong with my plan? I give a 45 minute talk, I fly 18 hours home, 18 hours back, and then give a two hour tutorial. What's wrong with my plan? Too many trips back and forth. Related to that is not doing enough work on each trip. You fly to Paris, have lunch, then fly to uh, Rome and have uh, uh, dinner, and then uh, you fly to uh, uh, Moscow for a night on the uh, uh, town. You're doing too little work as you go. So what you should do is fly to Moscow, do all of those things, then fly to Paris, do all of those things, and then Frankfurt. And then lastly, I didn't know what to wear when I was here. I had heard from so many books I've read that Russia is really cold, but the internet told me that it was going to be really hot. So my plan was I was going to bring all of my stuff. So I had them back, uh, uh, pack up everything in my house, several big containers and ship it over. That way I'd all have everything I needed to uh, wear. What do you think of my plan? What's wrong with it? Taking too much stuff with you. And so with multiprocessing, remember, you don't have shared data. So anytime you move data back and forth, send it into a process or get it back, you want to send only a little bit. Send in summary queries and summary results. These uh, comments sound obvious, but in fact, most of the time when people get poor results with multiprocessing, they're violating one of these three rules. They're like, oh, I'm calling the length function a million times in a multiprocessing module. I'm like, wow. You're pickling the data over, pickling it back. Oh, I sent over the multiprocessing module, it fetched a lot of data and then handed it back to me and I did a process on it. They're taking too much stuff uh, uh, with them as going along. I went over and just did one little thing and called the uh, uh, length function. You want to do a lot of work. These are the three ways to screw up multiprocessing. I've given you some SQL examples here because most people in turn it, understand it in terms of SQL. So I've got an employee database this one gets the entire database and then computes the summary. It gets too much work. This one loops over every uh, department and runs a query for each department. This makes too many trips. This is the right way. You send one query that does a lot of work on the other side and return your summary results. That's obvious with databases that if you try any of the first two, your performance will be terrible. While it's obvious with databases, people make exactly the same mistakes with multiprocessing, and here's the exact same three uh, mistakes, and I see them over and over again in code. And uh, in this case, we're returning the entire web page rather than its length, returning too much uh, data. In this case, we're returning one line at a time, too many trips uh, uh, back and forth. This is lots of range requests, and good news is it gives us summary data, but we're making far too many trips there and back. I see all of these mistakes all the time in multiprocessing code. I hope it will never happen to you. The very last thing which I will do in one minute, combining thread and forking. It's a simple thing. If you combine thread and forking, you're living in a state of sin and you deserve whatever happens to you. <laughs> this code was submitted uh, yesterday or the day before. Somebody said Python is broken because I combined threading and forking. This is a simple example that deadlocks every time. Their conclusion was Python was broken. My conclusion was that their mind was broken. <laughs> so here's the, uh, if you must, here's the rule. Thread after you fork, not before. And here's the reason why. If you uh, thread first, you create some locks. As soon as you uh, fork, those locks become shared across the different processes. You kill one of the processes that has a lock, all of the other processes hang as well. Fair enough, if you're going to combine them, and you shouldn't, if you are going to combine them, fork first, then thread, and everything will work fine for you, and you will not embarrass yourself by submitting this bug report to Python. 
which is interestingly still being argued. And it's like, oh, this should be documented. And it's like, it's documented everywhere. Don't do this. Or just follow me on Twitter. I'll tell you, don't do this. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Raymond. У нас есть время на пару коротких коротких вопросов. Thank you for the talk. Actually, maybe I missed it, but when we are using atomic queues, is still Jill involved? Like, is it efficient for CPU-bound applications with atomic queues? Thank you. Atomic. The question was, do the atomic uh, message queues decrease uh, your efficiency? If you write a correct program using locks that is well designed, it is not actually sequential, you're doing something almost isomorphic to using the atomic message queues. In fact, the, the queue module is a simply a thin layer around a list or a, or, uh, or a deck. It's a very thin layer with the locks on it for you, the same locks that you would have written anyway. So I believe there's no net efficiency uh, 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 cost to it. That said, whether you use atomic message queues or not, it doesn't take away the fact that we have a guild and that threading does nothing for you in C Python. So you would want to switch over to the multi-processing uh, version to take advantage of the cores. They have all the same concepts, including atomic message queues. Excellent question. Five rubles. 500 rubles. Hey. All right. Another one? Окей, okay, тогда ловите Раймонда в коридорах и приходите вечером на его воркшоп. The old Python regular expression joke. A colleague says, I have a problem and I want to use regular expressions to solve it. What do you say? Now you have two problems. That is an old joke that started in the Python community. It is uh, mutated. A colleague says, I have a problem and I want to use concurrency uh, to solve it. What do you say? Now two problems you have, 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 have. <laughs>